the recording is in progress, as we've been told, which is which is great. Uh, so my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is an ecosystem on one side of a lot of consulting firms from across the globe. Uh, we have lots of consulting firms, individual consultants on one side of our platform. And on the other side of the platform, we have our end clients in the Middle East, North Africa region. Um, so when a client asks us uh, for a certain problem that they're facing today uh, or an opportunity of tomorrow that they want to take advantage of. We put together a team of consultants and boutique consulting firms to help them with uh, solving that problem today or uh, taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we love to host webinars like the one we are hosting today, share insights from some of the boutique consulting firms, some of the uh, larger consulting firms uh, like MCA who are joining us today, audit firms, accounting firms, et cetera. Um, so without further ado, uh, I will pass it on to Sandhya, who's emceeing our event today. You will hear from me towards the end of today's discussion. Uh, one thing I should just mention very quickly uh, is please feel free to interact with us, especially uh, on the chat. Uh, and keep the session interactive, ask your questions. Um, and there will be a couple of uh, links that we will paste on the chat during today's discussion. So please look out for them. Uh, those could be really, really value adding uh, opportunities for everyone who's attending today. Um, so please keep a lookout for those. Uh, over to Sandhya. Uh, and thank you, of course, Girish and Nirav for today's session. But over to Sandhya for uh, starting off for today. Thank you so much, Varun, for the introduction. Um, firstly, let me introduce myself. I'm Sandhya Chandrasekhar, working as manager with MCA Gulf. Uh, it has been, say, four years, and I'm handling the taxation department. Uh, coming to, firstly, let me welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. A very good morning. As we all know, today's session is about the corporate tax, which will, which has been implemented on 9th of December 2022, and all the businesses have been impacted to the extent of 9% on the net taxable income, which will be impacting the bottom line of all the entities. So I'm sure everyone is interested and they want to address themselves, be prepared so that the implementation is smooth. Take your today's uh, agenda for the webinar would be the corporate tax law, the basics, key provisions, which will be taken up by our expert speakers, and also on how to prepare for the implementation. Let me introduce today's expert speaker for the webinar, firstly, starting with Mr. Girish Chand, who is a senior partner with MCA Gulf. He's heading the compliance practice covering corporate tax, VAT, ESR, AML, and UBO. He has conducted various corporate tax VAT ESR seminars for large companies, professional bodies, and industry groups, has been a regular contributor to Khalish Times on VAT topics. He has five years plus experience in consulting practice and 25 years plus experience in finance and internal audit senior managerial roles in diverse industries, and 10 years plus experience in finance leadership roles in the downstream oil and gas business covering marketing, retail, and trading. Coming to our the next expert speaker, Mr. Nirav Shah, who is Senior Manager with MCA Gulf. He is a Chartered Accountant, CS, CMA, and LLB with nine years of plus experience in the uh, corporate tax and international taxations. He has gained high professional tax practice by working with big four audit firms, assisted various MNCs, with respect to tax advisory, compliance, litigation support services, and conducted various corporate tax seminars, workshops for large companies. Uh, and also note, we'll be having a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, where it can be an interactive session where questions can be asked by unmuting yourself and we'll be addressing all your queries. And also note, we'll be giving a complimentary one-to-one one -one consultation as a complimentary offer for the first five registrants, wherein the link will be shared by our teammates over the chat box. Please feel free to post all your queries on the chat box and uh, we'll be addressing all the answers, uh, the questions. So over to you, Mr. Girish. Thank you so much, everyone, once again, for joining in. Thank you so much, Sandhya and uh, Varun for the 
initial introductions. Uh, like uh, Varun mentioned, the uh, weather today is uh, very good. As I can see from my room, it is slightly hazy. Uh, I think uh, I was drawing a corollary possibly to the uh, corporate tax, uh, you know, the legislations, right? Uh, so effectively, the visibility is there, but it is, uh, yeah, you know, there are some some elements uh, which are slightly easy. Okay, uh, maybe we can explain a little later, right? Uh, primarily the law is out, but however, we are awaiting uh, cabinet decisions to further clarify the uh, law, okay? So like uh, Sandhya mentioned in this session today, we'll take you through the basics. Uh, we'll take you through the intricacy of the uh, corporate tax law right uh, also talk about uh, free zones and uh, in the end you know the most important which is of uh, definitely of interest to you is you know how do we prepare for the upcoming uh, corporate tax since we know that as far as this legislation is concerned it is going to have a direct impact on our bottom line okay maybe i think we'll start the presentation first uh, with giving a short intro about uh, MCA so that we are put, able to put things into perspective. Uh, MCA as a company, uh, we were we are established in 2009, so we are in our 15th year. Currently, uh, we basically are in uh, five countries, uh, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, KSA, and Oman, right? Uh, we have got uh, you know, 300 plus years of you know, experience, uh, quite a few of them gray haired like me. Okay, and uh, as far as the clientele is concerned, we have over, you know, 1,300 uh, clientele, right? And uh, basically, you know, 1,500 successful projects executed. Okay, where, when we look at our services, uh, like you put in very simply, it is uh, basically right from you know, establishing the company to, like we say, God forbid, uh, the liquidation of the company. And we cover the entire gambit, including audit assurance, corporate services, the GRC function, which includes internal audit also, corporate finance, taxation, you know, outsource CFO services, in-country value, financial services. We recently are established also in the ADGM and we can basically audit companies in the ADGM. This is a leadership team. You can possibly see a familiar face there in one. And we have Nira Veer, also a senior manager taxation. Uh, in terms of industry, I think uh, we have been blessed that we have been able to cover most of the industries that are existing in the GCC, right? And I think uh, we will talk about it through our, you know, clientele list. Like we said, we are in uh, currently in five countries with eight fully operational offices. And this is our list of our clientele, whether it be in the MNC, financial services, in the real estate sector, in hospitality, healthcare, transportation, logistics, consumer products, technology, manufacturing, distribution, the government sector, energy and resources, uh, digital, and the others as such. Okay, I will be taking the uh, basics, the simple stuff. Maybe Nira will take you through the little complex stuff, but anyway, I'll come back in the end and, um, you know, basically uh, cover the perspective of how do we really prepare for the corporate tax uh, law coming up for so just to give a background, uh, when we talk about the corporate tax legislation, okay, uh, it started in uh, January 2022 with the announcement of the corporate tax uh, law. Okay, uh, basically in, uh, on 20th of April 2022, we are the public consultation document. Now this document was a little detailed document, which kind of spelt out you know, as to how corporate tax would be implemented. For example, things like free zone, it spelled out what would be liable for it as far as the free zones are concerned. But we must remember that it was a public consultation document, 
which is effectively a process which is undertaken before a law is promulgated or a law is published. So it is not necessary that whatever is there in the public consultation document would actually translate as far as the law or the regulations are concerned. Uh, however, uh, it does provide as a directional kind of input in terms of uh, how the uh, legislation is going to come into effect. And then we had on 9th of December 2022, the corporate tax uh, law being introduced. Of course, uh, like the when you refer to the law, I think I'd give the analogy of a building, right? Uh, as far as the law is concerned, it is primarily the structure of the building that is basically, uh, you know, put in place, okay? When we talk about, you know, subsequently there have to be certain explanations and clarifications you know, on the provisions of the law. Okay? And that is what, in the context of the corporate tax, it is referred to as uh, cabinet decisions. Okay, so these are basically the interiors of the building, which still need to be kind of done. There is one difference in terms of uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, the as far as the corporate tax legislation is concerned, as compared to the VAT legislation. In the VAT legislation, there was the, uh, basically the, you know, we had the legislation, the law, and then we had the executive regulations, which basically clarified all the provisions as such. However, in the context of the uh, corporate tax uh, law or the legislation, the expectation here is that, you know, effectively the, it will not be one executive regulations, but it is going to be a spirit of cabinet decisions in which the law would be further explained or clarified. So that is the slight difference. So, you know, effectively we would have to look at, you know, as to what are the legis what are the cabinet decisions which come out, which are further kind of explaining the law and we're expecting close to 40 to 50 cabinet decisions to be coming in the next, maybe two, two to three months. So here, yeah, when we talk about the corporate tax, uh, you know, as we all know, or maybe for people who do not know, it's a direct tax applied on the net income or profit of the corporation and other businesses, right? Uh, why is it being introduced? Obviously, yes, it is to cement UAE's position as a leading global hub. Okay, it will obviously lead to the development and transformation initiatives of the UAE, right? And more importantly is in terms of the UAE's commitment to tax transparency and harmful tax practices. That is uh, the reason where the introduction happened. Now, when you look at uh, corporate tax as compared to VAT, uh, like we have said, it's a direct tax. It has an impact on your bottom line. Unlike VAT, if you are efficient or if you do not have exempt supplies, there would be no impact on your bottom line as such. Right? In terms of effective, I think this is something that, you know, we need to make it clear. You know, because there is quite a bit of confusion still there as to when the applicability it is and whether, you know, the last six months of the year, whether we'll be liable for corporate tax. So corporate tax is for financial year starting on or after 1st June 2023. So when we take an example of these, right, so if suppose the financial year was from Jan to December, you know, if you can put up this, Jan to December, then, you know, primarily the year, the first year of corporate tax would be from 1st Jan 2024. And when we say 1st Jan 2024, there is no corporate tax, you know, liability prior to that as such. Similarly, if your financial year is from 1st April to 31st of March, in that case, the, uh, you know, you are basically the first year for which your liable will be from 1st April 2024. And the financial year is referred to as a calendar year or 12 month period for which the taxable person prepares the financial statements. Now, where do you get your financial year? Primarily, uh, you know, in most cases, if you are already into the auditing cycle, then your financial year is determined. Where, you know, possibly if you're not into the auditing cycles, it is basically determined by your, you know, largely it will be stated in the MOA. If none of the above is there, possibly you have a element of, uh, you know, kind of choosing your financial year as such. Now, as far as the rate is concerned, and this is one of the cabinet decisions which has come out because in the law, 
the limits have not been specified. Okay, so this cabinet decision has come out where we refer to as in case of taxable income up to 375,000, the, the rate of tax is 0%, and about 375,000, it will be 9%. And also, from a you know, basically the pillar two rules of the OECD PEPs, right? In case of MNCs who are having turnover in excess of Euro 750 million. There is a possibility that they could be subject to do a high rate of tax, possibly 15%. So we'll take a small example where we refer to, okay, if the net income is 500,000, in this context, the first 375,000 will be subject to 0%. And for the income above 375,000, which is 125,000, the 9% rate would apply. So what that would mean is that the net tax payable will be 11,250. Okay. At this point, I will land over to Nirav to take us through the corporate tax uh, law provisions. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Varun and Sandhya, for a very brief introduction and uh, Girish for taking us through the basis of the corporate tax law. Now, I will be discussing about the key elements of the corporate tax law. So, we'll start with the taxable person. So it's important to understand whether a person would be taxable or an exempt person because basis that the taxability will be determined. So who all are taxable persons? The taxable persons are also bifurcated into two categories, resident and a non-resident. Why this bifurcation is very important because depending upon whether a person is a resident or a non-resident, the quantum of income which will suffer the taxation in the UAE will be determined. So we'll understand first who all are resident person. So any individual or a natural person doing a business or business activity in the UAE will be considered as a resident person. Second, any entire entity which is incorporated or recognized in the UAE will be considered as a resident. So this will be a case. The second category will be any entity which is registered or incorporated in the UAE, whether in mainland or a free zone, whether it has a limited liability company or a joint stock company, etc. All these entities will be considered as a resident. Third category is any entity which is registered or incorporated outside the UAE. However, effectively managed and controlled in the UAE. So quickly with an example, we'll understand this. Assuming there's an entity which is incorporated in UK, however, uh, this entity is being controlled and managed from a person who is sitting in the UAE, then possibly that UK entity may be considered as a resident in the UAE. Now, what is taxable? So for a resident person, general understanding is that entire worldwide income is taxable in the UAE. So whether that resident person earns an income from the UAE or from dealing with outside the UAE, all such incomes would be subject to taxation in the UAE. Only exception to this is that for a natural person, only income which is earned from business or business activity in the UAE would be subject to tax in the UAE. Moving on to non-resident. So who all are non-residents? So any person who is, not, who is not a resident and having a permanent establishment in the UAE, permanent establishment is a case where a a foreign company, for, for an example, if a foreign company is operating or are doing a business in the UAE through a branch, workshop, warehouse, etc., this is this can be called as a permanent establishment. So any person not being a resident having a permanent establishment in the UAE deriving UAE source income. We will understand this little bit in detail in the subsequent slides. What is a UAE source income? Secondly, a person having a nexus in the UAE. Nexus has not been defined any it is expected to be defined by way of a cabinet decision. However, just for a general understanding, it is any business connection could be, it could be a business connection through which an income is earned from the UAE. So a person not being a resident, having a permanent establishment in the UAE, having a UAE source income or an excess in the UAE would be considered as a non-resident. And income from such activities would be taxed in the UAE. Now, what is that? This is a major difference. For a resident, worldwide income is subject to tax in the UAE. But for a non-resident, only these three kinds of income, that is income from a PE, permanent establishment, income from UAE sourced activities, and also income from any nexus in the UAE. Only this incomes are taxable in the UAE. Moving on to what is business and business activity. See, we learned 
that for a natural person only business and business act income from business and business activity is subject to tax in the uae so now what is business and business activity is not defined in detail and we are expecting a cabinet decision to come uh, come up with that definition but for a general understanding it may be a possible that any activity which requires a license may be considered as a business activity uh, generally you can say any activity which is conducted for the purpose of you can say profit motive such as industrial commercial agriculture vocational or professional activity could be considered as business activity but this analysis can be performed once the cabinet decision is released now we understood in the previous slide that the income of a non resident which is ua sourced would be subject to tax in the ua now what are those incomes so ua sourced income means income earned by a non resident from a resident in the ua or from a ua permanent establishment of a non resident or any activity which is performed such as located capital investments rights used or services performed or benefited from the ua so in a nutshell any income which is earned by a non resident from any activities activities or an assets or activities performed or assets located in the ua or a person situated in the ua broadly those kind of transactions or income earned from those transactions could be considered as a ua sourced income moving on to next exempt person so we learned who all are taxable persons now we will understand who all are exempt persons so broadly these are the categories of a person which are either doing a non business activity or the business activity which are anyway subject to tax at emirates level these kind of activities are these are these kind of persons are treated as an exempt person so these are government entities government control entities which are doing a sovereign or a mandated function extra business a person doing extraction of natural ex, uh, natural resources or related activities uh, which are non extractive in nature because those activities which are subject to emirates level already they are not subject to again taxation under ue corporate tax law other qualifying public benefit entities so any entity which is qualifying public benefit entity would be exempt from the corporate tax now for a general understanding it could be any entity trust charitable trust or foundation which is approved can be considered as qualifying but this is also will be clarified by of a cabinet decision or notified by way of cabinet decision so we'll have to watch out for the same qualifying investments funds specific you can say fulfilling specified conditions public private pension or social security funds and any other person who fully owned or controlled by the exempt persons as may be notified would be covered as an exempt person when these exempt person are doing an activities and earning an income which are not in relation to business possibly that would be subject we would not be subject to taxation however if these exempt persons are conducting any business activities those active any income which is generated from those activities could be subject to tax in the ua now it is important for us to understand which kind of income are exempt from taxation and accordingly we will not be required to pay any tax in the ua so those are dividend or other profit distribution from a resident legal person when we say resident legal person means any EU, so for an example any ua company distributing dividend to any person then that dividend will not be subject to tax in the ua in the hands of recipient similarly dividend and other profit distribution from a participating interest in a foreign legal person so assuming there is a dividend which is received from a foreign company that dividend can uh, can be also be benefited from the exemption only if that dividend income for that basically the investment qualifies for a participating interest now what is participating interest is that the investment in shares of at least 5% and that investment held, has been held for 12 months or intended to be held for 12 months and the company the foreign company in which this investment has been made is subject to tax at at least 9% in the respective country where it is incorporated if these three conditions are satisfied then it can be considered as a participating interest and then that in with any dividend from such kind of foreign company would be exempt from the ua corporate tax third cat any other income certain other income like capital gain for an exchange gain losses or impairment gains or losses again from a participating interest the important note to here is that the this other income would also be covering income such kind of income from a uae entities as well as outside uae entities so both 
unless we are fulfilling the condition of participating interest it would not be as exempt and subject to taxation so important point to note that only dividend from a resident or a ua entity is exempt without any condition fourth category of income income or of a foreign permanent establishment so we'll understand this with an example assuming there is a ua entity having a branch in uk and that ideally a branch is a part of the entity itself and accordingly the branch income will also be subject to tax in the ue however if that branch uk branch is subject to tax in uk at, at least 9% rate then that ue entity has an option to elect that uk branch income not to be included while calculating its taxable income in the ue and the, once that option is elected that uk branch will income would not be considered and only the rest of the income would be subject to tax in the ue fifth income derived by a non resident from operating or leasing an aircraft or a ship is also exempt from the ue corporate tax an interesting point to note here that in case we are earning any kind of exempt income we will also have to identify any expenses which are related to that exempt income because if the income is exempt we will not even get the deduction for expenses which are incurred in earning those exempt incomes now we'll understand free zone entities sorry so free zone as we all know free zone are an important part of ue so accordingly there is a there are specific set of provisions for a free zone in a nutshell any free zone which is qualifying free zone and earning a qualifying income would not be subject to taxation effectively because the, that income is subject to 0% tax so effectively you will not pay any tax on that income so now what is qualifying free zone so any free zone fulfilling five conditions so effectively four fifth one to be notified so four conditions then that free zone would be considered as a qualifying free zone these conditions are the free zone maintains adequate substance in the ue adequate substance means the free zone is not just on the piece of paper it is having an office employees and actual operations in the ue free zone deriving a qualifying income this is again a qualifying income is an important aspect which is presently has not been defined we will understand this uh, some hint from this this is a public consultation document in the subsequent slide and that free zone has not opted to be subject to ue corporate tax at 9% and it is complying with the transfer pricing regulation if these four conditions conditions are fulfilled then free zone can be considered as a qualifying free zone so what is the taxability a qualifying free zone person earning a qualifying income the income from that qualifying income or basically that qualifying income would be subject to 0% taxation effectively no tax any other income would attract the taxation at 9% also if a free zone entity is a part of a global or a group of companies fulfilling a, a basically an mncs having a consolidated global revenue of 750 million that would be subject to pillar 2 rules separately but presently those entities will also be continue to be taxed at 0% and 9% depending upon the nature of income they are earning corporate tax registration all the free zone entities whether earning a 0% income or 9% income or both are required to take the registration and do the filings now right? what is qualifying income so as we re understood it is presently not been defined we are expecting a cabinet decision to clarify that thing however the public consultation document basically a draft regulation as we will refer it had indicated certain income which will not be in in a certain income of a free zone which will not be subject to taxation so we are taking some hint but yeah we will have to uh, do this assessment when the cabinet decision is released but those incomes could be income earned from any activities carried out with a business located outside the ue any income from dealing within the same free zone or a different free zone any income from a regulated financial service directed at foreign markets passive mainland income having a dividend or a basically an interest royalty dividends or capital gains free zones in a designated zone with mainland goods related transaction where in the where the mainland entity is important on the record and group related main rent transactions these entities are possibly can be considered as a uh, you can say qualifying income but you will have to wait for the cabinet decisions for the same 
Now we will learn a couple of other key aspects of the UA corporate tax law. Uh, basically, we will be understanding six key aspects. So one is tax group. We all know that for the purpose of VAT also, there are provisions for formation of tax group. Similarly, there are provisions for a corporate, the formation of tax group for the purpose of corporate tax. These provisions, if we fulfill those conditions, then a tax group can be formed. The formation of tax group, the conditions are okay. That it needs, do you need to have a foreign or a, the parent company in the UAE and parent company holding a subsidiaries in the UAE. All the entities should be a UAE entities. If these conditions are the end, a parent is holding 95% directly or indirectly in the subsidiaries. Then none of the entities should be exempt or uh, any entity or uh, you can say freeze on entity with 0% corporate tax rate. All the entities following same financial year and seat, same set of accounting standards. If these conditions are fulfilled, then the tax group can be formed within those entities. Once the tax group is formed, then it will not be, the return can be filed as a one entity, not an individual entity level separately. Also, the consolidate, the income of a group will be a consolidated income of all the entities and there the intercompany transaction between the parent and a subsidiary will be eliminated. The benefit of this would be that since the transaction between holding company and subsidiaries are eliminated, this transaction will also not be subject to transfer pricing. Transfer pricing also we will discuss later, uh, later on. But if these conditions are fulfilled, a company, a group of companies can evaluate to forming a tax group. But this analysis requires a couple of aspects like what kind of income each entity is earning, whether they are, how many transactions are there between the group and all, whether the income of, a, is there any free zone entity having a 0% income or not. After the evaluation of all these factors, uh, we can take a call whether the tax group can be formed or not, or we should form or not, basically. The second topic is a tax loss relief. Here, in case an entity has incurred a loss in one year, the provision says that the loss can be carried forward for a future year. And in future, whenever that entity earns a taxable income, the taxable income can be reduced by way of this loss. And any income which remains after reduction of this loss can be subject to taxation uh, in the UA. Now the only condition, okay, the basic condition for carry forward is that the entity which is carry forwarding this loss should at least the shareholding should remain 51% same from the year in which the loss was incurred till the year in which the loss is set off against the taxable income. Assuming this condition of continuous shareholding is not followed, if the entity is carrying on the same or similar business activity, then also the tax loss relief can be claimed. Now, okay, now assuming these conditions are fulfilled, the only, um, there is a sailing on the tax loss which can be set off against the taxable income and that is 75%. So the loss which you can carry forward, which you have incurred, however, the set off in the future is restricted to 75% of the taxable income of the year in which you are earning a taxable income. So assuming I carry forward a loss of 100,000, in the future year, I am incurring, uh, I have an income of 200,000. Then only 75% of 200,000 can be claimed as a deduction in case I will be having 150,000, I have a loss of only 100,000, the entire loss can be set of assuming, however, the taxable income is only 100,000, then 75% of that, that is 75,000, only can be claimed as a set of against the prior year loss and the balance income will be subject to taxation in the UAE. The third provision which I'll be discussing is a tax loss transfer. This is a unique provision in the UAE corporate tax law where it says that if there is a person incurring a tax loss, it, the tax loss can be transferred to another taxable person having a taxable income. And that another person can reduce that tax loss and only on the balance, the you can say only the balance income can be subjected to UA corporate taxation. Now here also the conditions are that both these entities, uh, in this case, in both either one entity is holding 75% in another entity or both these entities are commonly held by one entity by at least 75% shareholding. None of the entities are free zone entities or 0% or subject to 0% corporate free zone entities, 0% corporate tax. Both are following same financial year, same set of accounting standards, all those conditions are applicable. If the conditions are fulfilled, the tax loss transfer provisions can be benefited. 
The other provisions are transferizing. This is one of the important provisions of the UA corporate tax law. Transfer pricing. In case there are transactions with a group of companies or a director or a shareholder, all those transactions need to be at arm's length. When we refer arm's length, that means a transaction value should be that as if the transaction would have taken place with a third party. So for each and every transaction with a group of companies or a shareholder or a director, need to be assessed from this angle, whether those are complying with the third party value methods. Okay, so now there are a couple of methods which are prescribed based on using those matters which is more suitable to that transaction. We will have to do this assessment and we'll have to identify whether transaction value is appropriate or there is change which is required to be made. The important part to note here is that opening balance of the first tax period also needs to be complied with the transfer pricing provisions. So that means, assuming I am following the Jan to December as a financial year, for me, the first taxable period would be Jan 24 to December 24. So this says that opening balance, that means the Jan, first Jan 2024 balances needs to be aligned with the transfer pricing. So effectively he says that I need to do this assessment ideally in 2023, whatever changes or impact needs to be carried on based on the transfer pricing study, I should factor in. So my opening balances as on first Jan 2024 are aligned with the transfer pricing. Next, we will understand about general anti abuse rules. So, now there are provisions which are dealing with anti abuse rules. So, these are anti abuse rules. So, after under, so we know that the corporate tax law has been published on 9th of December and it may be applicable to us either from Jan 24 or April 24 or some other period depending upon the financial year we are following. There is a possibility that there is restructuring may be carried out just to save on some taxes. And accordingly, the provisions are already in place, which are already effective even as of today to cover such kind of practices or in arrangements which are solely structured to take the corporate tax advantage. So this provision says that in case you're entering into a transaction or an arrangement and the purpose, the main purpose is to say it's to obtain the corporate tax advantage and doesn't have the commercial rationale. Then such kind of arrange, arrangements or a restructuring may be disregarded and the tax, tax liabilities may be worked out as if those arrangements never took place. So if after understanding the impact of the corporate tax provisions, if we try to plan something which does not have a commercial rationale, those activities may be subject to guards. So accordingly, any such kind of planning or and restructuring should be looked at from the anti-abuse provisions. Couple of other provisions quickly. All the taxable and exempt persons are required to maintain all the records for effectively seven years. That means current year. So basically first tax, tax period and the seven years after the completion of a tax period. So effectively for eight years, all the records are required to be maintained. Financial statements are required to be prepared based on the accounting standards applicable in the UA or recognized in the UA. IFRS, we, love, we know that IFRS is generally followed, but yeah, any other standard which is accepted in the year can be followed. And certain category of IFP taxable person to, will be required to have the financials audited, but we are expecting a capital decision to clarify those things. Moving on. Now we will understand how to calculate a taxable income. So I will take the base of accounting profit and we'll make an adjustment for expenses which are allowed, not allowed, exempt incomes which are exempt. So these adjustments would be required. We had already understood what, what are, who ought, all incomes are exempt incomes, but now we will understand which kind of expenses are allowed, not allowed so that we can make suitable adjustments. So expenses which are allowed, there are a couple of examples. So basically any, they, it says that any expenses which are incurred for the purpose of business and which are revenue in nature would be allowed as a deduction. Fees paid to local or federal government would be allowed as a deduction irrecoverable VAT. So basically any expense which we have incurred, like our purchases on which we have paid VAT, but those uh, VAT inputs are not allowed as a recovery when we've determined our VAT liability, those VAT inputs will be allowed as a deduction. Then next category is expenditure incurred with dual purpose. Assuming we are incurring an expense, which has an element of business as well as personal use. Then to the extent of Business use only, the deduction would be allowed to the extent of personal use. We will have to disallow that expenses. 
the expense the example of such kind of expenses could be car expenses mobile phones those needs to be evaluated whether there is any personal use and to the extent of personal use we will have to disallow proportionally that expense entertainment expenditure deductible up to 50% any so here the the definition or the meaning of the entertainment expenditure is any expenditure which is incurred towards meal accommodation etc of supplier or a customer could be considered as an entertainment expenditure if you have incurred such kind of expenditure only 50% would be allowed as a deduction rest we will have to disallow now we will also understand expenses which are not allowed as a deduction and accordingly we will have to disallow those expenses while we calculate our taxable income these are donations grey grants or gift to other than public qualifying benefit entity so in case we are giving a donation grants or gifts to a qualifying public entity the deduction would be allowed or to in case to any other entity other than public qualifying benefit entity then that would be disallowed bribes fines and penalties or any such kind of illicit payments are not allowed as a deduction dividend paid by uae companies dividend is like so this is basically a so we are referring this to an entity distributing a dividend so if the company is distributing a dividend it is actually an appropriation of profit and accordingly cannot claim a deduction of that dividend any corporate tax paid in the uae or outside of the foreign or any outside the uae in any other foreign country is not allowed as a deduction however we will get the credit of those taxes that we will understand later on or any input vat which is recoverable so any input vat which we have incurred on the purchases which we will we will recover while calculating our vat liability that since we have already used it to reduce our vat liability the same is not allowed as a deduction for computation of taxable income qua interest expense there are specific set of rules to identify whether the interest will attract disallowance or not so there are general rules and a specific there is a general rule and a specific rule so general rule says that any interest net interest expenditure so basically income interest expenditure minus interest income so net interest expenditure in excess of earning before interest tax depreciation and amortization excluding exempt income any interest expenditure in excess of this would be disallowed but it's not a permanent disallowance so that excess amount which has been disallowed will be allowed to be carried forward for set off in the next 10 subsequent tax periods general rule is not applicable uh if net interest expenditure does not exceed that threshold this threshold will be specified by way of cabinet decision subsequently and also this general rule is not applicable to banks and financial institutions those are actually into lending business and accordingly cannot be applied to them there is there is a specific rule in case we are having a borrowing from a related parties if an entity has borrowed a loan from a related party and that loan has been utilized to fund an exempt income when we say fund an exempt income that means if the loan has been utilized either for capital infusion or distribution of dividend then those kind of low interest which are incurred in relation to such borrowings would be allowed as a will not be allowed as a deduction and accordingly we will have to disallow this now we have understood what are exempt income taxable income expenses which are allowed not allowed or disallowed now we will take an example how we will compute our taxable income and a tax liability so we will start with an accounting profit based on the profit and loss which you have prepared then we will make an adjustment for unrealized losses there are provisions which say which gives an option to a taxpayer to either claim deduction for unrealized gains and losses as in when accounted or to opt for a taxation only on realization basis so assuming if we are opting for in uh, taxation on realization basis whatever unrealized losses which we have accounted will be added back we will reduce the exempt income because those incomes are not subject to taxation we will disallow the expenses which are not allowed say for example personal expenses entertainment expenses fines penalties etc in case our transaction with group companies shareholder director are not at arms length and the transfer planning adjustments is required we will make that adjustment and that way we will compute the taxable income as you will notice that the accounting profit and taxable income is different this will be in major of the cases so we will have to pay tax based on the taxable income so up to 375000 taxable income up to 375000 there are 
there will not be any tax return. Income in excess of three seventy five thousand dirham in this case would be eight fifty thousand dirham would attract a tax of nine percent, which will be seventy six thousand five hundred. We will we can claim a credit of taxes paid in the UAE or foreign country. So we will claim that as a relief here. And net, well, what comes like six fifty thousand five hundred will be required to be paid from our pocket. This will be actual tax outflow for an organization. Quickly, we will cover the compliance provisions. So registration, all the taxable persons are required to take a registration. The time limit for taking a registration is nine months before after the completion of first tax period. Basically, that's the same period by which we are supposed to file our first corporate tax return. There are no thresholds. So all the entities, whether in free zone, mainland, are required to take the registration. Even if we have obtained a VAT registration, the corporate tax registration is required to be obtained because both are separate. And now, uh, basically, in case we discontinue business activity or we cease to continue, then we have to apply for a deregistration. Next, we will understand the corporate tax return. The, each and every taxable persons are required to file a corporate tax return within nine months from the end of the taxable period. Transfer pricing documents may also be required to be filed along with the corporate tax return. But this will be specified subsequently by way of a cabinet decision. Next, tax payments. So liability we understood from the previous slide how we will determine our corporate tax final outflow. That is basically a payment which is required. That payment which will be required to be made within the nine months from the end of the taxable period is the same for taking a registration as well as filing a return. As far as first tax period is concerned, there are no advance tax. So company can pay the taxation after. A, Completion of tax period before filing or basically at the time of filing a corporate tax return. In case you have paid the taxes in excess, the refund can be claimed. Next, tax credits. In case we have paid taxes in the UAE or a foreign company, we can a foreign country we can claim a credit for those taxes. And uh, you can see the the for as far as the foreign taxes are concerned, the credits are only restricted to. Taxes on such foreign income paid in. So assuming that foreign income is attracting nine percent tax here, but in foreign country I have paid tax at fifteen percent. So I will get the credit only up to nine percent. Excess will not be allowed as a credit. Neither will be allowed as a deduction. Assessments. Certain category of a person would be subject to assessment, but with this will be, you can say, covered subsequently by way of a cabinet decisions. So now we have learned. The basics as well as the various nuances of the UA corporate tax law. The next important thing, which comes is how do we prepare for the corporate tax assessment and implementation? Here, I will request uh, Girish to kindly share his perspective how to travel this journey. Thanks, Nirav, uh, for the detailed uh, presentation on the corporate tax uh, legislations. I think now we come to the as far as uh, you know, taxpayers are concerned, the most important part as to how do we uh, basically prepare for the corporate tax journey. You know, uh, when we look at it, majority of the entities, the applicability will be from 1st Jan 2024. Yeah, so I think a lot of the people are thinking that uh, they have a lot of time, but I think uh, after today's presentation that we have seen on the corporate tax provisions, Right. Uh, so effectively, the uh, previous year, that is a year before the assessment year, is also important as we have seen primarily where there is an uh, element of, uh, you know, the transfer pricing related implications as such. Okay. So this presentation is largely covering the four points. Uh, why bother now? <laughs> the key risk to avoid. Uh, what is the implementation methodology and what are the phases that we normally do as, uh, you know, where we are providing consulting to the client on the impact assessment. So why bother now? Obviously, uh, you know, as far as the, you know, direct tax regime is concerned, uh, we have so far not been exposed to a direct tax uh, regime, uh, right? Uh, also, you know, there is a varying degree of accounting and auditing practices, right? There are still entities which are, they look at the bank account and 
they refer to you know whatever is there at the end of the year in their bank account as their profit right so obviously now with the you know corporate tax coming in i think that will no longer be applicable uh, you would be expected to maintain proper accounting record as far as auditing is concerned in the corporate tax law it is not mandatory but as we all know that whenever you have to substantiate something to the tax authorities it is always good to have an independent kind of uh, you know uh, in independent view of your accounts okay and which is generally referred to as an audited account right so that's something that would likely to become uh, you know a norm uh, rather than an exception okay uh, more importantly when you start looking at it from a structuring perspective right uh, as we have seen that you know you have certain decisions to be taken okay whether especially in case of where you have got multiple group entities you know do you go uh, as a single registration uh, do you kind of basically look at it as a tax group okay also in terms of when you look at your transactions if there are a lot of related party transactions you know you now need to kind of demonstrate arms length so which would mean that you now need to look at your transactions and structure them to see that they are able to demonstrate an arms length kind of principles okay also what we have seen is that during nirav's presentation is that there are quite a few places where you are expected to do some elections yeah in terms of when you talk of a free zone you have an option of electing that whether you want to be you know exposed to a 9% these are relevant for you know foreign entities which are having you know kind of subsidies in the free zone so they have an possibly they need to look at it whether they you know kind of take the 0% or they subject themselves to a 9% so that in the parent company jurisdiction possibly the differential taxation does not come into play so these are some some of the considerations that you need to look at uh, on the most important element uh, like we said there is a straight impact on your bottom line right so effectively whatever you are earning from 2024 possibly you know that is something which is going going to get eroded by about uh, 9% right and i think uh, no businessman likes his profit eroded by by a minimum of 9% so yes what do you do do you take a reduction in profit or do you kind of look at you know whether there is a scope for revenue optimization or whether there is a scope for possible cost reductions that you can do so that you still you know maintain the same level of profitability or like every ambitious businessman as in terms of growing his profitability so these are you know decisions that need to be taken obviously what we are saying is that these are the risks that we need to basically allow is that uh, you know not have enough time to prepare obviously as we know that whenever we take decisions in it they are not likely to be with a kind of understanding the full implications of what we are doing right similarly when we deal with uh, you know any kind of uh, you know taxation related matters right you know inadequate understanding or tax treatment understanding not being there is not something which is uh, you know kind of uh, you know basically you know pardoned by the tax authority i, I think we we sometimes learn it the hard way through the penalties and uh, you know basically the fines that are there so that's what we want to avoid uh, in larger entities you know maybe because of when we talk about the allowables and disallowables there is also a scope of looking at whether we should build it into your accounting system so that you can easily try you know kind of transit from a accounting profit into a tax profit so that's something that you may want to look at so next slide so largely when we look at the implementation methodology these are around the four pillars okay like we mentioned earlier of the structure okay the transaction processes okay largely where you need to kind of map your process and basically see that what are the tax related implications system changes comes in is where you might have to make some changes to your you know accounting code so that you are easily getting your tax profit from your accounting profit training and communication is always important uh, as the organization 
the, as the organization grows larger, you know, there is an importance of, you know, kind of making everybody in the organization aware of the implications of possibly the legislation related to corporate tax. So these are the four pillars of implementation. Yeah. Uh, now, the last piece is what we refer to as the corporate tax implementation journey. So we tend to basically take it that, you know, we would, we can start yesterday. Right, because when we are currently at what stage we are, we are having about a 50 to 60 percent clarity as far as the uh, corporate tax is concerned. So we should start, and that is what is referred to as the preliminary impact assessment phase. Subsequently, we can, you know, once the cabinet decisions are out, so that's where we get into a detailed impact assessment, so that we evaluate all the impacts that the provisions of the corporate tax is having on our business. Right, and then you get into the implementation phase where you start making the changes, whether in terms of structure, uh, whether it is in terms of related party transactions, you know, whether it is to the extent of what is the disallowables that are likely to impact our business as such. So all these decisions need to be made, and you know, post 2023, that's where we get into the actual year of assessment. So if we are doing this kind of planning, so we are. I would say is that uh, you know, our readiness is very high and we are able to kind of you know transit smoothly into the you know assessment year. And this particular plan that we refer to is with a reference of a company which has a financial year from 1st Jan to 31st December 2023. Okay, I think with that. Uh, we come to the end of our presentation. Maybe we leave the slide so that people can note down our uh, you know, contact points as such, anyway, as such. And uh, over to you, Sandhya. You'll take us through the q and Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Girish and Nero, for taking us through the uh, corporate tax law and you know the action plan to be taken. It was really in, uh, informative, and I hope everyone is benefited. Uh, coming to the uh, Q and A round, uh, starting with uh, I'll just read out the questions, and we can take up the questions, sir. So starting with uh, there's a question by Mr. Sagar. I think you can take George. I think he's uh, he had some questions and. Maybe he had put two, three times a clarification. Maybe you can take him, unmute him, and let him ask his yeah. question. Yeah, we request Mr. George to uh, unmute himself and ask the question. Please. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Girish, uh, Neera, and Sandhya. Um, as always, you know, it's been a pleasure attending the sessions. Uh, again, as we are in the learning process, the clarity keeps going on. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll quickly go into the questions. Uh, an establishment which is a foreign entity, a uh, non-shareholder, having assets, typically apartments in the UAE, are handing over these to an operation management company. Uh, will we be able to derive a profit share which is uh, from the bottom line after the tax is paid by the operations management company? Will the profit share be subject to uh, corporate tax again. I think George, you'll have to put it a little more simply because the words you have used are little. Sorry. Know, the corporate jargon. <clears throat> the words you are using are like the corporate jargon. Oh, so okay. You can put it a little simply. Uh, when you refer to the establishment which is outside, is this a company or is it? A, it's a. It's you refer a somewhere company. about, uh, you know, some related party like you. Is it? Uh, relating to an individual who is having an apartment or is it a company which is having a, it is is having a real company, estate? It is a company which is... So there were two questions. The first question is a company which is having an apartment, mm -hmm. which is, again, the UBO is, uh, again, the related party only, which is the shareholder. So, yeah, we can leave that. So the company owns apartments in UAE? Yes. In its own in name? Dubai. In Dubai, yeah. In its own name, yes. Okay. And this is not registered. The company is not registered in UAE. No. Okay. And it has given it to a management uh, entity. Yes, which is registered in the UAE. A real estate management entity. Exactly. Yeah. And this uh, real estate, what is the arrangement with the real estate management entity? 
to derive uh, rental whenever it is occupied on a daily basis or on a short let or on a, a long let. Okay. And uh, that the real estate entity will, the management entity will do in its own name or in the name of the foreign entity? The rental will be connected in the management name and will hand over the rental proceeds to the foreign entity by keeping a margin of 20%. Yeah, so there is a business relationship and maybe uh, George, like we had this uh, thing about uh, the one hour consultation session, and maybe in terms of also your confidentiality and you know, so we could possibly get on a call separately okay. and talk okay. about this. Yeah? Sure, sure, sure. Because it's, it's, a, it's a very specific kind of. Uh, no worries, no. Done. But all I can say is that there are two parties, both of them are earning income in UAE. So there is a, you know, basically it's a case of possibly like Nero mentioned, even for the foreign entity, a UAE sourced income. So those implications are there. Right. Once the once the main entity pays a particular uh, tax, does the sub holders also have to pay a corporate tax? Is what? No, but here here the thing is that the man the management entity is connecting a fee. Yeah. Right. So if you the fee suppose the rental is hundred, right? The management entity is only collecting ten. Right. Right. Because that is what it is, and ninety is given to the foreign entity. Correct. Okay. So when you talk of the Local management entity, the income which it will be shown is only 10. Right. No, what they, will to the pay, 19? They, they will pay tax on the full income because they are receiving the full income. They will pay tax on the full income and uh, claim it as an expense. No, no, so what happens if their net income is 10? Because 100 will be shown net as income is 10, correct. Rental, possibly, right? And yeah. 90, uh, you know, 90 is shown as expense. Yes, 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 correct. So yes. They are paying tax only for 10. Right, right. I agree. Yeah, yeah. 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 So then the question is, what happens to the 90 income? Ah, that has to pay tax later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. In that way, it has to pay tax. Yeah. Okay. I think you got the yeah yeah broad uh, principle. The only thing is, if we pay it as a profit share rather than uh, I think that let's let's talk about this offline. Yeah. Oh, so, sure, sure. Thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, coming to the question by Mr. Sagar, what about free zone companies? Yeah. yeah. So Sagar, we discussed about free zone entities. So a free zone entity being a qualifying free zone entity fulfilling uh, four required conditions and earning a qualifying income will be subject to 0% tax vision. So effectively no tax. But any other income which is earned by that entity would be subject to tax at 9%. You can unmute, Sagar, if you have like any further question, but this is broadly the taxability of a free zone. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Coming to next question by Mr. Enrique Lopez. What about sole professionals, freelancers registered in a free zone of UAE and doing business with an entity established in mainland, also subject to corporate tax? I think this continuation of the free zone. So, you know, yeah. So, but uh, as a sole professional uh, here, Hendrik, we will have to also refer as an individual. The condition is where only the business tax income from business and business activity is subject to tax. And possibly what, what you are referring could be falling into that category of business income. But since uh, you are on a free zone and dealing with a main entity, possibly this may not be considered as a qualifying income and subject to taxation in the UAE. So this is what the broadly the taxes so of uh, possibly your income would be subject to tax at 9%. Thank you, Nirav. Yeah, uh, the next question is by Mr. George. Yeah, we can connect next, uh, like after the session, surely to take you through. Uh, we would like anybody who would like to ask the question can unmute yourself, please.
I think uh, Sandhya, maybe uh, people are happy with our presentation. Anyway, I think uh, we have our numbers and all. So if somebody wants to yeah. get in touch, and I, I guess uh, also, I think the uh, you can also again mention about the free consultation. Yeah. So uh, please see the link is there in the chat box uh, where you can register yourself for the free one hour tax consultation session where you can discuss all the corporate tax readiness and any other tax related matters. Please feel free to connect to us, register here and take the benefit. Okay, Varun, for the final closure. Sure. So uh, thank you, uh, uh, everyone. Thank you, Girish, Neerav, and Sandhya for this wonderful event. You know, one thing that we like to do is just take a quick photo, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so if, uh, Pranav, we can be unpinned and everyone who is comfortable with it can just switch on your cameras so that we can take a bit of uh, a quick photo with everyone, if that's okay. I'll give everyone a minute to switch on their cameras, fix their hair, and put put on a smile, you know. And essentially, I'll be saying one, two, three, tax, and then you all have to follow after me and say one, two, three, tax. But I'll just wait for a few more people to switch on their cameras quickly, if that's okay. How do I do? Uh... Also, in the meantime, what we will do is uh, we will post uh, very quickly here. Um, we will post uh, another quick link to uh, take the one hour free consultation session with uh, MCA. Uh, we'll also post a link to join our WhatsApp ecosystem so you can receive opportunities from us uh, if you like that. Um, then we'll take a quick photo. Just give me one second. I'm just trying to figure out uh, how to have only video participants on my uh, view. Ah, there you go. Perfect. So I think uh, I'm ready if everyone is. Uh, one, two, three, tax. One, two, three, tax. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for uh, this. We'll post this on social media as well, of course, and looking forward to our next uh, meeting. Uh,